Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunities that you give us each day to commune with you. And we know, Lord, that um, we are so unlike you and that the privilege we have of fellowshipping with our creator, that we, we sometimes take it for granted. But we just ask, Lord, that um, the time that we spend here, that we will be drawn close to you and to one another, and that we can see clearly uh, the path that we are that our feet upon our feet are upon that we can walk that path um, faithfully and that it can lead us to the celestial city we give our hearts and minds to you we give our lives to you we ask that you can help us to minister to those around us that that you can be seen in all that we do be with us now in this study through thy spirit we pray and ask in jesus name amen okay well good morning again and uh Yesterday, we had a discussion. Well, Kelly was here. He's not here yet. Maybe he'll show up. And, and what we were addressing was this, these passages here dealing with uh, the 2520. And so we talked a bit about the church's response to the 2520. We had had this discussion on, on Sabbath as well. And then a little bit yes, yesterday morning. So, we, we know that these verses here that are talking about, and, and this whole section here in Daniel chapter 12, is address, addressing the 2520. That is, that is the prophecy that Daniel does not have understanding of, because he has an understanding of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, but their connection to the 2520, he hadn't sorted out. And that's what Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are about. That's what his last vision is addressing. So we know that Seventh-day Adventism, because they don't recognize the 2520, they don't understand the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism, and the two periods of 1260 years, it has hindered the Adventist church in moving forward with the three angels' messages, even though we had professed to, to give those messages, and to some degree we still profess that, though I would think that the average Seventh-day Adventist definitely doesn't know what the three angels' messages are. And definitely they cannot place the first and second angels' messages. And I've had conversations on social media with people who are scholars and um, pastors and and leaders in the church um, where they don't seem to understand this. They, they don't quite understand what the, the three angels' messages are. So they have some sort of vague notion of, of some sort. But it's not connected with Adventist history. They don't, they don't understand Adventist history. Now, we, we look at the historical application of these verses, and we know that this is addressing first the time, times, and a half for the scattering of the power of the holy people. And then it's going to talk about the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. So it's going to be addressing both halves of this 2520. Uh, the first one is a time, times and a half. And, and the second one, the second half dealing with the 1290. So it's not going to specifically mention the time, times and a half for pa- papalism in Daniel chapter 12, but it is a period of, of 1290. And, and that's a question that we, we've never really answered why in Daniel chapter 12 that the 1290 is going to be used to represent the 1260 for, for papalism. We've sort of touched on it in different places, but, but, it, but it might have some, um, implications when we start looking at the present truth application. And then, of course, we have the 1335. So, you know, they could have, you know, Daniel could have or the angel could have, you know, dealt with another period talking about instead of 1290, they could have talked about, um, you know, 1260 starting in 538. But we know the starting point, the date that was given to Miller. There's three different dates that were given to Miller. There's 677, 457. BC, right? Both of those. And 508, correct? As we understand it, those are the three dates that were given to Miller? Yes. 
Yeah. So so he wasn't given 538, according to Miller. He's given 508, which which is kind of interesting. And, think, and uh, what's that? I think those of the other churches would have been um, understanding 1798 being the timeline as well. So it wouldn't have just been Mulvaya Miller. That might have been a popular understanding. Yeah, well, different people had different times. I mean, I know there were some people that had 607 as a starting point, uh, decree of focus. But yeah, there were other people that had that. But as far as the way that he did dealt with the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, I actually think that was unique to him. Yes. Yeah. But I think maybe, okay, there would have been others with different dates, but I think there was a general, at least there was some other ones. Protestants, I think, would have mm. identified 1798. Yes, other people identified 1798. Um, that that, but as far as how he put together the, you know, the 508 with the 1290, some people would put the, just the 1290 and the 1335 and the 1260 all starting at different times. So there was different schemes that people had, but Miller's was kind of unique. Now, there's if anybody's ever read the Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers by uh, Froome. Not that I generally recommend Froome's writings, but he does document a lot of other views that were held. You know, you, so you can, in that book, you can see what he has compiled as far as what other people had put together. But there was a lot of people trying to address the prophetic periods at that time. Um, so Miller wasn't the only one trying to address them. And so there was this general knowledge that somehow the prophetic periods were coming to an end in that period of time. Some people had different end dates. Some had um, 1847, some had 1860s, uh, some had 1870s, right? Different, different, because they they were using different prophecies, but they weren't all put together in such a beautiful system as, as what William Miller had. And especially when you start to consider that Miller's, Miller's understanding was incomplete. That is, now that we have put together all of the prophetic periods in their structures, connected to the past, um, and so forth, uh, we have actually, we, we can see way more than Miller could, could have seen, right? For one, is he didn't have the two 2520s. And, uh, you know, different people tried to start, you know, the 2520 at like lots of different places. They would start with the destruction of of the temple and people had different chronologies of the Bible as well. And, and a lot of times people were trying to fit the chronology into some preconceived date that they had. And, and we see things similar in, in, in my, my lifetime. I've seen people continually change the date of creation so that the 6,000 years is going to be ending soon. So there are people constantly wanting to use the 6,000 years as the time of the second coming, you know, back in 1987, you know, it was supposed to end then and then in 1994. And, and so people just keep changing the chronology to fit some idea that, that we haven't reached 6,000 years yet, but we know based on creation, 6,000 years ended about 1955, 1956 based on the chronology that we have worked out. And, uh, you know, I believe that the time has been extended, but also we don't know exactly when sin occurred and whether that's exactly 6,000 years of sin or that's just, you know, 6,000 years of sin has passed and God has just extended the time. I don't know. It's, but the point is that people constantly are trying to gerrymander chronology to fit some kind of preconceived plan that, you know, they can predict when Christ is going to come. So when we're dealing with this, so we're trying to look at first the historical. So we know the historical of what's being talked about here, that, that Daniel is having this vision that's going to deal first with the, the beginning of the 1260, because that's really where Daniel 12 is focused upon, because you're going to have the end of the 1260 for paganism and then the beginning of the 1260 for papalism, but he's going to focus upon the taking away of the daily, which is going to be 30 years before the end of the 1260, 
right? So there's the scattering of the power of the holy people. It's given as a time, times, and a half. So he's going to accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people. And we also focused a little bit yesterday on this question of how long. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So we have Kate's for end. We have the word accomplished or finished, 3615. So Kate's is 7093. It finished 3615 is the strongest number. And then we're going to have this other word where, uh, let me see, he's going to ask more specifically 319. So we're going to have 319. What shall be, so that's in verse 12 or verse, uh, yeah, verse 8, pardon me. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said, I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So you're going to have this word. Um, Archeathos or Keathon or something. Can't remember how to pronounce it. So we have these three different things that we could call that all mean basically the same thing. The end of something, something to be completed or ended. But this word, uh, 319 means he's basically asking, well, what's going to happen after that? So he wants to know what the, not just what is the end of this prophetic period, but all of the events that are going to follow. And he's told that that's closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So this time of the end, we know 1798, but we also have a time of the end for our time, 1989. And we, we compared Revelation chapter 10, Daniel chapter 12. We've done that many times in, in this study. And we know that, um, the sealing up of the seven thunders that's going to occur in Revelation chapter 10 is going to be unsealed in our history. That is, the repeat of history is going to unseal those seven thunders that have been sealed up. Now, it doesn't specifically anywhere that I've seen in Revelation state that. It doesn't say, it just says seal up the seven thunders. So why could we, and I know I'm jumping around here, but I want to cover these things. So why would we say that the seven thunders have to be unsealed? Maybe they just are sealed up. And, you know, the idea that they're unsealed is just some fantasy on our part. How do we know that they need to be unsealed? I think partly to accomplish God's purpose of prophecy. Prophecy. Okay. Yeah, so just in a general sense, we'd say, well, the book of Daniel ha- is has been sealed, and it's going to be unsealed. And then it says that he's not going to understand the end of these things. That is, what's going to happen at the end, but that it will be understood because it's going to be sealed up until the time of the end. So he's actually not just asking about Millerite history. He's asking about the second coming of Christ. So there is a connection between the unsealing of the book of Daniel, which is going to be unsealed in Millerite history, but parts or aspects of it are going to be sealed up until the very end. So it's, it would be implied that the things that the seven thunders uttered that, um, are going to be sealed because he says seal up those things, they would have to be unsealed. Now, the other thing about sealing, when we think of this, yeah. Well, they, they, yeah. Are they not being are they not being unsealed now? Well, they have been unsealed. We've unsealed the seven thunders. That's what right. this movement has done. Yeah. But but the idea of a seal is what what is a seal? What is the purpose of a seal? It marks uh, a communication from an authority having his name and, and territory on it as well. Yeah, okay. It's an authentic or whatever. Yeah. So when something is sealed up, it, it's it's sealed with a seal, right? And that seal is a stamp or a mark or an impression. Um, and and we know obviously if it's the seal of of a king, it has his dominion, right? His his authority, his territory, all those those things, his title, all those things are there, right? We see that in the Sabbath as a seal. But if you send something that's been sealed up. It needs to be unsealed in order to be understood, right? There's there's no point of sealing something up. And, and the idea here, if you look at the Greek, you can see uh, this word seal up. It means to stamp for security or preservation uh, 
by implication to keep secret, right? So something can be sealed up, but it has to at some point be revealed, right? You, you wouldn't just seal it up and, you know, if you didn't want it to be understood, you wouldn't just seal it up. You, you would destroy it, you know, but, but that's not what's being told uh, to John. He, he, you know, he just says, seal these things up. Don't write them. Okay. And so they're sealed in some way. Also, as soon as he says that, then the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. So we can see that this, what the seven thunders is addressing and is, and that is sealed up. We're, we're actually seeing the indications of a seal with this swearing of the oath and this oath we connected in Daniel 12 to the seven times, right? So even though we don't have the Hebrew here of swear, which means to swear seven times, it would still have been there in the Hebrew. If this was written in Hebrew, it would have, it would have used 7650, an oath. And then, uh, when we have in 10 verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So here we have this word finished. Now again, we're dealing with Greek, but we can see that that idea, the idea of the finished or the end or completed or accomplished is still here. And this is under the seventh trumpet. So under the sixth trumpet, things are not finished in that sense. Yeah, Jeff, you have a comment? Oh, no, sorry. My mic is on. Okay. So the question that Daniel is asking, when shall be the end of these wonders, right? We know that this this must be not just Millerite history, because, and I think Daniel is getting the idea that it's going to be, like he's getting the idea of Millerite history at that point. But he wants to know our history, right? He wants to know the history of the second coming, not just the history of the end of the 2300 days or the end of the 2520s, but he wants to really know what's going to happen after that. And he said, you, you're not going to know that. That's sealed up. Now, it's true, Millerite history is also sealed up, right? Because it's in Millerite history that Daniel, the little book's going to be opened. But we know also that, that things don't just end there. They didn't just end with Millerite history. And the seventh angel begins to sound October 22nd, 1844. And then you're going to have in verse eight, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, uh, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went in unto the angel. I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now, this is true of Millerite history, but it must also be true of our history that we have to eat the little book. And, and did we eat the little book? Did this movement eat the little book? I know we're eating it now. Yeah, we're eating it now. But did we have a, a message that was sweet in our mouth as honey? But as soon as we'd eaten it, it made our belly bitter. Would we say this yeah. is the message of July 18th? Yes, we did. Yeah. Now, of course, this is talking about Millerite history. I'm not saying that it's directly talking about our history. But and then it says, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So even though we have this Millerite history, there is a prophesying again. That is, this is telling us that this history has to be repeated, right? So Millerite history isn't the end. It's typical of something that is our history. Uh, just with the, yeah. the element of sweetness. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Millerites, they were looking at the, the coming of Christ, that they would be taken to heaven, mm -hmm. to live the eternal glory. So you can understand that's a sweet message to them. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's not really the same, you know, to see the destruction of a city. How is that going to be sweet? Okay. 
Good question. Now, when we think about, I mean, I, I guess I can only speak for myself, but in understanding the the chronology and the way everything came together. So, you know, we look at how July 18th was developed and we can see this in the study that, that I'm doing on, on Sabbath dealing with the symbolic use of numbers. I wouldn't say that what we were prophesying was sweet, but the way in which this was unfolded to this movement was sweet, right? Because we could see God's hand, his providence. I would uh, put it maybe yeah. this way. It was, it was a taste of the sweet honey of Palmoni. Mm-hmm. I know that's not in a verse anywhere, but it's kind of like it would illustrate the idea of tasting, tasting the sweetness of that understanding. Palmoni. Yeah. That was new to me after 20 years in the church. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, it, it pulled together everything that I'd understood as a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I actually believed that if Nashville was going to be hit by a nuclear attack, that that was going to be the bitter experience. So I knew that the bitter experience, the disappointment, was going to be one of two things. It would be either that Nashville was attacked, and that would actually have been more bitter uh, than the disappointment of it not being attacked, for me personally. Um, Amen. It uh, was a fearful thing for me, yeah. in, a, in a sense, because so much would happen all at once. Yeah, I wasn't looking forward I to it. I wasn't prepared. I was not prepared. Yeah. Well, well, there's two things. So one is obviously I would care about the people in Nashville and what was going to happen in the final events. That These are not going to be pleasant things. And even for the Millerites, I mean, the second coming of Christ, of course, is sweet. But they believed all kinds of terrible things were going to happen as well, right? So, I mean, the destruction of the earth uh, by fire, right? And the judgment against the wicked and all those things. So... So there is a sweet and a bitter aspect to both of those. But, uh, um, you know, I was, I was more relieved when Nashville didn't happen. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have called that really a disappointment. What I would say was more the disappointment is the way the movement reacted to it not happening. That was actually much more difficult for me. So I can only say what, you know, what I experienced, but the sort of the animosity. Uh, that that existed after July 18th. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't very. It was, very amazing. It was What's that? amazing to me that it was amazing to me that people, I don't know, glossed over, passed over the the facts of around how that developed with the public announcements. You know, I mean, we went around the world for free, and the money was even returned for paying for that advertising. So if God didn't do that, I don't know who did. Yeah, I mean, I definitely saw God's hand in it. And of course, you know, know, 187 days later, you're going to have the bombing in Nashville on December 25th. Um, So you're going to have that symbol there. You know, and then 187 days after July 18th, the School of the Prophets is sold for 18.7% below market value or below what they asked. You know, there was just all of these things that the movement... The movement could have come together even in the failure of the prediction, but they didn't, right? So I'm not really sure. To me, that was the disappointing part, is just the way that people, all this infighting was occurring. And um, and people attributed to, you know, to me, all kinds of attitudes that I didn't have. I always hate when people do that. They somehow can read my mind that I have some kind of secret agenda that uh, I'm not revealing, that I'm deceptive or something. That, that's the most annoying thing for me. Yeah. So. Maybe yeah. an aspect. So, what's maybe that? An, as- an aspect of uh, bitterness, maybe. You could maybe uh, assign to that as well, to Nashville, is that it is going to be destroyed, but they're not going to have the opportunity to have, to know when. You know, to have that sort of, it's going to be destroyed. They had a, and maybe you could say it's like sweet, to, okay, the city's going to be destroyed, but you have an opportunity to leave, to get out. Yeah. But now they, now they don't have that. So it, it is going to be destroyed, but they won't have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So 
however we want to look at it, I, I do believe our message was sweet as honey. I believe we were eating this little book in this movement, not, not even just in connection with July 18th, but with all of the messages of, of this movement. These definitely were sweet. But we weren't really prepared for the bitter experience, right? We didn't really know what that would be. Um, and, and obviously, if we look at Millerite history, we would know that there would have to be a bitter experience. And especially once we had made the prediction. I mean, to me, it seemed like, well, how are we going to avoid the disappointment parallel with the Millerites? Now, I know that uh, Parminder's movement was trying to say, well, you know, all these other ones are imperfect, ours perfect, and we don't make mistakes. And to me, I, I saw that we would have to have something that paralleled Millerite history. And, you know, I mean, we could... You know, we could have tried to argue maybe November 9th, 2019 was sort of that bitter experience of the separation that happened in the movement over that prediction. But if we lined it up with Millerite history, really the best way is to look at July 18th as typical of October 22nd, 1844. That is July 18th, 1844 is typical of October 22nd, 1844. And October 22nd, 1844 is typical of July 18, 2020 in, in that context of the movement in that line, in that repeat of history. So, um, so when we go back to Daniel chapter 12, you know, he wants to know the end of these things. What shall be the end of these things? And, um, the number there is 319. If you noticed in the Greek, the word for honey was 3912. Whether that's significant or not, we know that 319 has the digits of the 391 and, and you could take, uh, the 3192 as having all the digits of 391 and a half, just with the two and the one together making a half using the one twice in that sense. And, and we can see that the message, uh, that, that we gave now, now what's the other connection to honey? So, so we know that there's the one of, of, of Jonathan, right? When Saul makes them, they're not supposed to eat anything and Jonathan eats the honey, right? And his eyes are enlightened. So we have that one. The what's, what's the other? Lord. What's that? The psalmist, the psalmist, the law of the Lord is sweeter than honey. Okay. Yeah. There's that. We also have Bumblebee Road, which North Bumblebee Road, uh, where the school of the prophets. Yeah. The, the one I think is, is in Isaiah chapter seven, you know, butter and honey shall he eat that till he know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And so one of the things that I see with this idea of honey is, and, and we see in, in the Millerite history and we see in the three angels messages is the separation of two classes. That is this making of a choice, right? So there's this choice that has to be made and and when we look at Daniel 12, he's going to ask all these things about the end. His book is going to be closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And then many shall be purified, made white and tried. So that's the righteous. But the wicked shall do wickedly. Right. That's the wicked, of course. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. So there's these these two classes or groups that are demonstrated and one of the things we believe about our history is that it's a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And that's what we have had happen in this movement. So if we try to pull all of these things together, we can see if we're going to look at the present truth application of these verses, we, we've already stated that um, this is addressing the 2520, the understanding of Millerite history. The understanding of the structural chiasms, those are illustrated in this, the two men on either side of the banks of the river with Christ in the center that parallels the cross, the two thieves on either side. Um, so it's a chiasm. And then the one is going to ask the question, how long? And the answer is going to be unto time, times and a half. So that's going to refer to the first half of the 2520 for Northern Israel. And of course, this parallels Christ's 70th week. So first that has to occur, right? So he, he wants to know that. So that's that's going to be sort of the beginning of these things, right? That's the, the 2520, that's the first half. But Daniel says, you know, I still don't understand 
I want to know the end of these things. And now he's going to be given more detail. Uh, and we'll look at that detail in a moment. So if we're going to put some red writing in here, I mean, how, how would we do that? I mean, even we haven't really put in what the historical application is. So we probably need to write that in first. So I'm going to write this here. We have the 1260 years of paganism. That's what's being addressed there, 1260 years of paganism. And we noted how if we added up these numbers by tripling the times, three years and a half, 2677, seven, we added those together, we would get a period of time that is 1260 years and seven months, but it relates to the 1260 years of paganism. Seven months just as a symbol from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month could represent that period of time, which we call Millerite history. But anyway, and the seven times itself. So we got the 1260 years of paganism. Now, we said that that paralleled, um, what, what did it parallel in our history? Because we're going to, we're going to have the 1260 years of, of, um, papalism as well later on, but, the 1260 years of papal is, paganism is going to be that period of time that precedes the fourth generation, right? Because you're going to have Ephesus, Smyr Smyrna, and Pergamus. That's still going to be under paganism, right? That's pagan Rome, the period of pagan Rome. And then you have Thyatira. So this period would represent in Adventist history, uh, the history from of the first three generations, let's say. Does that make sense? So if we're going to put it this way. Does that make sense to people, what I put there? So that's going to bring us up to the fourth generation. And that's the scattering of Adventism, so we would say. So this would be then, whoops, I don't put equal there. It should be in between. Um, so in our present truth application, we would have... Scattering of the three angels' messages from 1844 to 1957. Okay. Is that making sense to people? Yes, it is. Also, I noticed in the paragraph above you, have, <clears throat> there is uh, two, 2008 and 2009, and I was wondering if there was anything major in the movements in 2008 and 9. Okay, yeah. So the numbers of 2008 and 9, I, I do think so. I mean, that's before I was in the movement. But when, when we looked back at our history, what was the significance? What was happening in that movement at that time? It's Maybe way you know. before my time. So. so you're going to see basically these other groups coming into the movement in that history. So, I mean, it's going to happen gradually. So the question is, well, when did all these other groups sort of join? But it's going to be in that history, 2008, 2009. So those groups, you know, they're not there from like, 2004, they're not there. They're going to slowly start coming in. So you're going to have Miliano's group, Jamal's, all these other different people. Um, the guy with the last name Howard, I can't think of his name once. It's, um, the black preacher. And then there was a few other ones. So these, these different groups came in and it's in that history. But, um, you know, whether we want to, how, how we would look at this, because he's going to behold. Right. So behold, the word behold is two zero zero nine. And then he's going to be on one on this side and on on that side. Now, you can see that this and that in Hebrew is the same word. That is, Hebrew does not have a distinction between this and that. Right. It, it's just the same Hebrew word. And there's other words like that in Hebrew as well, where there there is a distinction in English, but there isn't in in Hebrew. So, um, and these words, uh, henna, which is like hither and thither, like here a little and there a little. Again, there's no difference between here and there, this or that. So if we look at this word and then, so that's the word 2008 and the word 2009 is henna, behold, lo, see, if. And you know, the question is, are these words related? We also have 2004. Hen, they, these, the same. And then 2005 is also hen. Behold, lo, though, is an interjection. And then 2008, um, which comes from 2004. And then 2009, which comes from 2005. 
So I thought that was kind of interesting as well about those words. So, you know, maybe we could go through and, and like, if you look at these Hebrew words, so here, I'll show you what I'm looking at. So, so we have these Hebrew numbers, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, right? And maybe we could look at these as representing years in our history of the movement. And that might be possible. Um, well, we did that in Judges. What's that? We looked at years in ju- Judges, too. So could yes. we be doing this? Yeah, that, that's yeah. what I'm wondering, you know, if we could make some sense out of this. Um, and so I'll just go through here quickly. So you got 2001. So we started at 9-11 in Judges. Judges chapter 2 gave us 9-11 to 2023, right? Now, it's interesting that the word 2001 is Haman, right? So 2001 is Haman. Now, Haman is the one who brings in the Sunday law. And, and we marked that the Sunday law begins in 2001. 2002 means a necklace or a chain, right? Now, it's actually an Aramaic word, hamnik ham, or hamnuik. Chain of truth. What's that? I said the chain of truth. Yeah, it could be the chain of truth, something like that, yeah. And, you know, that word is going to occur in Daniel 5, 7. Right when uh, there's a chain of gold, he offers to put a chain of gold around a Daniel's neck. So it's an Aramaic word, so it doesn't occur many times in the Bible. Daniel is one of the few places where we have Aramaic, and it's going to be in Daniel chapter five. Now we know that Daniel chapter five addresses the twenty-five twenty. So maybe there's some connection there. Okay, so see how this is working out so far. And then we have uh, two thousand three uh, brushwood. Hamas, uh, as far as doesn't say that it, where where it occurs, it's one place. Isaiah sixty four two, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. So that's the melting fire that burneth. Not sure exactly how you would apply that, but but that would be two thousand three. Two thousand four is when we're going to come to understand. The 2520, and it's in 2003 that we come to understand uh, 911. So it's in that history we start to come to understand 911 as uh, the um, the formalization of the message. It's parallel to uh, yeah. So the 2520 in 2005. You're saying that that's when Dwayne do? I think it's before then. My understanding is it's 2005. That he first introduces it to Jeff? Yes. At the camp meeting in 2015, I recall Dwayne Dewey saying in 2005, he called up Jeff and said, have you ever noticed this 2520 on the chart? What does it mean? Yeah, because you have... Okay, they were were looking at the charts before then, though. Well, Jeff had the chart just to... uh, He wasn't wasn't really identifying 2520. He had the charts because he was using that to... Uh, look at the pioneer understanding of the daily to highlight that. Yeah. And uh, I think it was in the Ozone that Dwayne went, he met Jeff there. Was then, so that was like November 2004. And so I think it was uh, sometime after that then, 2005. Okay. When, yeah. um, I always thought it was in, in 2004 in the fall there. Okay, if it's 2005, that's fine. So 2004, the word there is that word that's based upon um, the one of the banks on the side, right? So it comes from that word just uh, that is this side, right? So it's not really side, it's the word this. So they're in with all we're in. And we're going to have uh, the ozone camp meetings in 2004. So 2005 is this word behold, which is going to be the basis for the 2009 uh, number, right? So, and then 2006, it's just the Aramaic for that, for hen. 2007 is henna, that means these, right? So, uh, I'm just seeing if it's, yeah, so you're going to see that in Judges 8 1. First mention would be Genesis 41, verse 19, uh, talking about the kind, right? So that could relate to the seven times as well. Uh, 2008, that's this. And 2009, that's behold. 2010, 
is release. That's only in Esther 2.18. Uh, the king made great feast unto the princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. So that release would be a day of rest, holiday, or giving of rest, holiday making. And um, and then you're going to see 2011, lamentation, 2012, uh, Hannah troubling, um, it's a city of Me in Mesopotamia, 2013, hush, keep silence, be silent, hold peace, hold tongue. So that's, you know, how we would apply that specifically to 2013. I don't know. To Judges 319, that's when uh, the, the quarries, right, in Gilgal. So that's going to be Ehud, right? So, so that's kind of interesting. 2014. That occurs in Lamentations 3.19 means intermission. Mine eye triggleth down and seeth us not without any intermission. Uh, 2015 turned, hafak. Um, and so it's a change, a change, converted, overturn, overthrow. Genesis 3.24, that sword that turns every way. That's hafak. 216 is contrary. 217 uh, means turning as well. 218 overthrow. 219 Proverbs 21 verse 8 froward. The way of a man is froward and strange. Uh, 2020 deliverance. 2021 chariots. And you can see these words are not showing up many times, some of them. Of course, 2022 har. That's amount. Uh, 2023, whore, which is um, just a place onto Mount Whore. And um, 24 is Hara. So, you know, whether we could, and we could say, well, 2025 has none. It's the word Haro. It doesn't occur in the Bible. So we could just say it goes from 2001 to 2024. I don't know. It, we would have to spend more time with that and, and look at all the verses and so forth. But we can see that maybe there is some correlation between events in this movement and these, these different Hebrew uh, numbers. So it, it is an interesting idea. So now when we, we go back to our document, that we have this scattering of the three angels' messages from 1844 to 1957. And... Now, Daniel hears this, but he understands not. Now, this would then be, uh, who is Daniel then representing in our history? Because he's going to hear something, but not understand it. Who does, who does he represent? Okay, even, even historically, who does he represent? When he hears, but understands not. Is he representing uh, the Millerites? Or is he representing some, something else? Because we understand that when a prophet's in vision, that he can represent, it doesn't necessarily represent himself. Represent the Millerites, Millerites and us. Okay, so. And there are any other performatory movement that made mistakes, made mistakes, you know? Yeah, so so I think he would represent a group group of people that wants to understand, but 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 has not understood. And that would represent this movement. So is there some way that we can connect this, you know, to 1989? Is there, you know, how, how would we, how would we look at that? Any, any way we could. Okay. So I heard, but I understood not. So he, we have, we have I, right? So that's just 589. Heard, age 085, but did not understand. Now, if I take the word heard, 8085, and I count it from 911, which we've been doing, it brings me to October 31st, 2023. I don't know if that's significant. Obviously, October 31st, Reformation Day as a symbol, but in 2023, is that significant? Not that I know of. So, you know, so are things that we could look at with this, and, but is there some obvious symbols? How about what shall be the end of these things. We see 319. You know, we already have looked at that. We know that that is the digits in 391. Would that connect it to this movement? Now, this, this verse itself, uh, 
the Hebrew numbers of this verse add up to uh, 18,996. Now, 18,996 is 18720 plus 276. Now, we know that um, 52 years on, on our calendar is 18,993 days, right? So so can we take something about this verse and this number, 18,996? So that is 18,720 plus 273 is the difference between uh, 52 prophetic years. So I'll just show you this here so you can see it more readily. So this had to do from the time that I was born until I was 52 years. That's going to be obviously my 52nd birthday, but 273 days before that is 18,720 days. So there's the difference between 52 prophetic years. So if I go 52 times 360, so the Mayan calendar uses years of 360. So 52 Mayan calendar years would be 18,720 days, but 52 times 365 and a quarter is going to be 18,993. Now, the verse itself, all of the Hebrew numbers add up to 18,996. So if I subtract 276, I'm going to get the 18720. Now, are 276 and 273 related? Yes, they are. Acts 27, right? Yes, you, so you have maybe the three that represents the priests. Right. And then 73, the Levites. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we have something that's that's close to the 52 years. It's just three days off, right? So if we're going to address uh, the end, right, because that's that's what he's asking. I heard, right? So he heard something. Now, he didn't understand it. But then he asked the question, what shall be the end of these things? Now, so that's going to be, you know, what's going to happen afterwards? Now, we know that we connect the Mayan calendar, that 13,000, 1,872,000 days, right? Because that's uh, 144,000 days in the back tomb, and there's 13 back tombs. Right. So it's going to be one million eight hundred and seventy two thousand days to December 21st, 2012, when I meet Heidi. Right. So we have that one eight seven two. And then if I go from my birthday, it's going to bring me to this. My birthday, my 52nd birthday is going to be seven hundred and seventy seven days after the start of that 13th back to. Right. So when you get to thirteen zero 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 zero. December 21st, 2012, that's 777 days. And then if I count 504 days, that will bring me to my 33rd wedding anniversary, May 9th, which is May 9th is April 26th on the Julian calendar. And then 273 days later, I turn 52, right? Which is, so we have that symbol there. So we have the nine, the one seven, the one eight seven two zero. We have the 18993, and then this verse gives us the 18996. So, I mean, this could be just some kind of coincidence that, that this happens, but it could be giving us information about this verse. When it when this question that's being asked, what shall be the end of these things? So he has heard, uh, but understood not. And then he's going to say, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So he's asking about this time. And, and we can put this specifically into that 777 structure, right, into that, that chiasm. That, that's the history of this movement dealing with the 777. And, and my, my personal history uh, dealing with that as well, right? <clears throat> uh, the sum of this uh, verse, the gematria is, is 813. And the reverse sum is 1131 combined is 1914, the differential 318. So just looking at some of the numbers here, the reverse Bible verse is 9013. You got the 391 symbols in there. It's, uh, 
the 22,090th Bible verse, but it's that lexical sum, the 18,996 that interests me. Now, so we're already connecting it with our history. We're just wondering whether these these things allow us to to see the connection more clearly. So I'm just going to put a footnote here. So I'm just putting that there for now. Maybe there's something else. I'm going to put a period. Okay. Okay. So we have that lexical sum. We're just taking a note of that. So that question, um, those that hear but don't understand. Uh, generally, we're supposed to hear and understand. Uh, Isaiah 6, 9, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. Um, Isaiah 6, 10, make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their ear eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and healed. And Jesus says, I speak to them in parables because they see and see not and hearing hear not, neither do they understand. Matthew 13, 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. So Jesus is going to quote those passages from Isaiah. And um, Paul's going to quote it as well. So that seems to be the main verse. It's quoted in the New Testament by Paul and Jesus. And so that's hear and understand. We'll look up hearing and understand. I guess I should show you what I'm doing. Right, so you're going to see this same idea. It's it's uh, going to be just be so the same idea. So the only place we actually have this besides Daniel so far, just putting heard and understood. Psalm 81:5. Thus he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. Uh, have you not known? Have you not heard? This is Isaiah 40:21. Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood that from the foundations of the earth? So we can make, connect this with the foundations in Daniel 12, 8. And I heard but understood not. So would this have to do with people hearing a message but not understanding it in our, in our history? And how would we then apply that where a message is heard but not understood? Any thoughts on that? What would this message be that is heard but not understood? What is it that Daniel hears but doesn't understand? Is it is it the sealing up of the seven thunders that he doesn't understand? You know, it's obviously not talking about the seven thunders here, but is there something about Millerite history he's not understanding about the unsealing of the seven thunders? So he's been given he's been given an understanding here regarding the scattering of the Jews. Now he's not been yet given the 1260, the 1290, the 1335. It has been given the 1260 back in Daniel chapter 7. But I believe he represents this movement or Adventism. He represents something that is heard and not understood. Now, the question is, does he represent the Millerite history here of hearing and not understanding? Or is it our history, the history of the Adventist church? Does it represent the fourth generation that is heard but not understood? Or do we bring it, like, historically, I'm, I'm talking about here? Well, I know that when I've tried to share this with people that are non-SDAs as well as SDAs, and some of them SDAs for quite some time, they say it's just incomprehensible. They SDAs don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. SDAs, but non-Adventists seem to understand it. You've noticed that. Um, not the ones that I've talked to, but I haven't shared it with, with too many, because the ones that I have shared it with, just a little bit, they say this is way beyond us. Because they haven't, they don't know Christ, a lot of them. They don't know the word. They don't know where this is coming yeah. from. Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've shared it with other Christians. And they seem to understand it. You know, July 18th, they understood. There's many non-Adventists. that, And even after July 18th, they still said, we think you're right. You know, it just, it's going to happen later. So I found that that non-Adventists were generally more receptive than Adventists to this. Now, now we have understood not, right? So obviously have the word understood, and then it's negated by 3808. 995 plus 3808. So that's 4,803, which is a little over. 
13 years, so 13 years, and probably about 50, 55 days, 13 years and 55 days. Well, sometimes these numbers take a little bit to figure out, but you know, I'm going to have to spend a bit of time with some of these numbers here. But um, what I would say, obviously, is we can put in here that I think the people that hear that but understand not in the historical application, um, Daniel's representing. Now, now Daniel's representing the people of God in some way. I'm just going to say he represents the people of God in some history. So he represents the people of God in, in the historical application. And then he's going to ask the question. Right. So what shall be the end of these things? So this would have to be in Millerite history um, because that's what they want to know. And then we would parallel it with our history. So can we make an argument that they hear but don't understand? And that's it. It is kind of a it's a negative thing, but there still are the people of God that hear that don't, don't understand. And, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to put that. So when it says go thy way. Uh, the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. We know that this is Millerite history and that we have to relate this to, in our history, the un unsealing of the seven thunders. Right? That's through, through the understanding of Millerite history. Now, we already said historically, the many purified being made white and tried is the three angels' message messages, Right. So this is, that's the three angels' messages. And in our history, so I don't need to put in our history. So in, so in our history, this is the repeat of the three angels. So we have the repeat of the three angels' messages. That should be pretty clear. And then two classes are going to be produced. There's the wicked. And none of the wicked shall understand. So that means that the wise will understand, as it says. So there's a group of people that hears a message. The message they hear is the three angels' messages, right? And that message is, so when we go back here, we'd have to say, and I heard, that is, the three angels' messages. That's what he's going to hear. But he doesn't understand, that is, everyone's going to hear and not understand. But the one group is going to ask the question, what shall be the end of these things? So so what is that question? What shall be the end of these things? What is that question? Now, it says that they're going to ask this question, and it's going to be closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So when Daniel's asking that question, he again is representing the people of God asking that question. So there's a time when this three angels message is given. It's not understood. But there is this question that's asked, and that question is is addressing the end of these things, right? So the words are going to be closed up and sealed, but many are going to be purified, made white, and tried by this message. The ones that are purified, made, and white, and tried, they're going to be the ones that understand it. The ones that aren't purified, made, white, and tried, they will not understand it. So, So we still have details to work out here. And, and I'm not going to be here uh, tomorrow. Dwight will be here tomorrow um, to, to, to address whatever he's going to address. But we will come back to this at least on Wednesday. So I would have to say, so I'm looking at the, uh, the end of these things, right? So we got these, these two numbers, 319. We know that uh, 319 is an iteration of 391. So that's the end, you know, 428, Allah, it's prolonged from 411. These are those, and we flipped that word before. It occurs 721 times in the King James. Okay, well, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study this morning, and we just ask that you can continue to work in our lives. I pray that you can bring us together again to study your word and to understand these things. We know that we have heard, but we want to understand. We want to know the end of these things. I pray for each person searching for truth, that you can lead and guide them, that your angels can watch over them, and that you can help us to reflect your character in all that we do. 
forgive us for our sins, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.